Thank you, Ryan. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here in front of you all because this is the first time in the history of my life I didn't have to drive on the 407 to Toronto to do something in Toronto. Uh, so welcome to, to my community of Ancaster, Ontario. Uh, I live right across the street from uh, this campus. When the bubble is lit at night, it shines a light into my bedroom. Good for me, not good for my wife, but anyway. So today's presentation is gonna be a little unorthodox um, because I did speak at, at this event uh, last year and the year before, so some of you are kind of tired of listening to me. Uh, I'm gonna do a very, very brief highlight of our current Canada soccer strategy and where I see it going. Um, and what I've done is I've printed out hard copies for you to follow along on the pillars uh, of the strap plan. Hopefully it's legible. Uh, for those of you that want to save trees and don't want paper, uh, you can go to the Whova app and in the Whova app there's a link and in the links you'll also see a, a digital version uh, of the strap plan highlights as well as some of the slides I'm going to show. Um, and then the second part of the presentation is my area of expertise at McMaster University. Some of you know I have a real job where I actually do pay, get paid, pay the bills as opposed to the volunteerism that we all do and love. Um, and in that particular part of the presentation, I'm just going to focus a little bit about managing technology and information bombardment, which is uh, basically trying to understand how to work smarter instead of harder in a world of tweets and texts and messaging and all that kind of stuff. So that's a very generic presentation, but I think every single person in this room, whether you're a coach or administrator or a volunteer, we're all dealing with that sort of stuff. All right, so first things first, got to start with family. Like as I said, live across the street. It's a pleasure because I see so many friendly faces in the room, people that are part of my soccer life. Um, you know, it, uh, we got Hamilton Sparta. Dave, it's awesome to see you, buddy. Thanks, Dave, longtime supporter of Hamilton Sparta. Of course, that's the youth club that I coached at uh, for many years where my two boys started uh, that bubble. Dave, how many hours have we put into that bubble training you know it's uh, it's an amazing thing so thanks for Dave being here but I'm also happy because I have not seen him in probably what 10 years is uh, Tony Lupinacci over here so for those of you that don't know him uh, he used to be the head coach my old head coach of the most dominant soccer club in the history of Canada soccer if I say that too loud people get offended in the room and they'll start throwing things at me uh, but uh, back in the day Tony and I are from the hood any of you here from Scarborough <laughs> Earl's from Scarborough. So Tony was my head coach at Scarborough, Missouri for 10 years, so great to see you. Um, and I know there's a lot of other people, I don't want to skip people, but I don't want to you know, be standing up here just calling people out. Okay, so soccer, big part of my life. I played, um, I went to Western and I played at Western, uh, and then after I graduated from Western, um, back in the day, we didn't, you know, we're talking late 80s now, didn't have uh, the MLS, didn't have the CPL. Uh, we had something called the CSL back in the day, so played, uh, you know, what you would not really call semi-pro soccer, but that was what we had back then uh, for a club called London City. Uh, then moved to Toronto to get a real job and uh, spent a lot of years in banking before I decided to go back to school. And uh, when I went back to school um, at Western, I also ran track. I was a pretty fast white guy, a Earl, back in the day. So. Uh, was a sprinter, was a long jumper, it helped me with soccer, but soccer was always my real passion. Track was just, you know, using uh, the ability to train. Uh, had the privilege also of uh, meeting my significant other in London uh, when I was at Western, who's going to walk into this door right now, and I'm going to embarrass the hell out of her, but... <laughs> because of my uh, wife, we uh, uh, had the pleasure of um, having three kids, two boys and a girl. Two boys are soccer players. Some of you know that I drive them to Toronto every single day for training. How many of you came from Toronto in this direction and said, wow, this is a little farther than I thought it was? <laughs> and I tried going the opposite direction during traffic every day uh, for six years, uh, including today that I have to go when I leave here because they got a game. Uh, daughter, uh, Tia Maria, talk a little bit about Tia because she belongs to a wonderful sport called cheer sport. And soccer could learn a lot from cheer sport. So I, I have the pleasure of getting to know that sport really well. Uh, great governance, innovation in cheer, uh, all about kind of girl power and the team spirit, uh, integration of skills from dance and gymnastics. It's also been approved by the IOC for an Olympic sport. 
So it's probably the fastest growing sport. Um, and Tia happens to be a flyer. So for those of you that have ever watched a cheer on TV or, or live, she's the one they chuck in the air. And as parents, we're the ones freaking out if she lands on her head, which she has a couple of times. She's got concussions, ripped groins. A couple nights ago, she uh, you know uh, damaged her knee. So we think we got problems in soccer. Cheer is uh, a whole different category of injuries. But that's the reason why I want to get home at a reasonable hour because this idea of information bombardment is really about taking our lives away from our work. We're all passionate about soccer and let's be honest, many of us in this room are schizophrenic. Soccer is one parallel of our lives and then we have our other life which is our job or how we make money or if we're a student or whatever and being able to kind of balance that is a challenge. So uh, very early on I was interested in this idea of work-life balance. Work-life balance, by the way, does not exist. It is a myth. There's no such thing in the world as balance when you are who you are. We are soccer people in this room. One of the things that we all want to do is win as well. So when we win, we don't say no to anything. So we want to work and make money and enjoy a career, but we also want to have family and leisure and go on a vacation. Don't you want more of both? So there's no balance. Eh? A balance means when one goes up, the other one goes down. In this world, we want more of everything. It's a consumerism word. We want to make money, get a job. We want to live life, have leisure, we want soccer. We, 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 no one ever says, I don't want that. We want everything. So in a world where you want everything, you have to kind of figure out how to kind of understand what are the knowledge nuggets that you need to survive from a productivity perspective. So the first thing that I want to talk about is about our enterprise. As vice president of Canada Auger, one of the things that I'm very, very focused on is this idea of growth. Okay, so you notice that our three pillars are uh, develop, govern, and grow. And I mean, I'm not going to spend too much time on the developing and the governing part because you know what? That's what this whole conference is really about on the developing side in terms of coaching certification and building a pathway for our elite players in this country. Uh, I spent a lot of time after I migrated from, from being a player to becoming a coach and ended up, uh, I have a national B uh, on the coaching side. Uh, so that developing side, I think we're doing a really good job at. We've, uh, come a long way, especially in the last five years, to actually create a more sophisticated development pathway. Jason and Earl and others are in this room. That's their job. Um, and I think that is a pillar that we've got a good handle on in Canada. On the governing side, as you know, we went through governance reform. Uh, not only at CONCACAF, when we had all the crap that Victor talked about yesterday, but then also through Canada Soccer. That's how I got involved. So we moved away from you know, this idea that if you're a club president, you become a district president, district president, provincial president, provincial president, you become Canada soccer boards. So we moved away from that kind of traditional mindset of governance to a more competency-based model. So over 10 years ago, we, we did a call, I remember, when Canada soccer was going through its reform. Brenda was in the room. She was the one, like, firing a thousand questions at me, uh, trying to say, is this guy legit? Does he have the, 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 the horsepower necessary? Uh, and now we have a board that's uh, full of competent professional people migrating to a more manageable size. Ontario soccer, as everybody in this room knows, uh, also followed suit and we went through that kind of reformation process in the last couple of years. So I think we've got a good handle on that. In fact, Marco Leal, who was uh, here from CONCACAF yesterday, again assured me that you know, all the struggles and all the challenges that we face on the governance side, we are still miles ahead of so many other countries around the world. Miles ahead. I mean, we're talking about things now in governance that countries can't even dream of talking about. Uh, it's one thing to have a competency-based board, but now we're talking about diversity of the board, which is another thing that, that uh, you know, I regret. I think we should all regret it in the room. And that is that when we look at our players, when we look at a photo of our national team, women or men, that photo does not look like our board. Our board has to be reflective of the players that play. So how do we bring more women into the board? How do we bring ethnic racial minorities, diversity, First Nations, um, you know, LBGTQ, uh, uh, para? We have to work hard. It's not easy, I can tell you. You can't just have an election and assume that women or ethnic minorities can win an election against uh, an old white man. Uh, that is still a challenge, not because they're not competent, but because the electorate still has biases. So we have to think of new and innovative ways, I think, to migrate our boards. I have the same challenge as a university professor. I'm chair of the strategy department at McMaster. You know, look at the profile of our students. 51% of students in Ontario universities are female. Uh, majority are female at McMaster as well. But ask the question, how many faculty are female? 
right? So it's the same sort of challenge that we've got to work on uh, in trying to get the representation up. So when we look at the soccer industry landscape, it's really the third pillar for me that I want to focus on, that we should all focus on. How do we grow the game? Growing the game means participation, means coaching, means revenues, means money, means growing it in terms of the share of wallet, the share of attention that we get. Uh, we talked obviously last night and today about consumerism of football. Um, it's something that we don't spend a lot of time talking about because it's a very business kind of perspective to talk about this idea of growth. And sometimes people think that that's wrong, that it's negative or some sort of, it maybe bismirks this idea that, you know, we're, we're, we're in a sport that should be not talking about that. I'm here to tell you that that is not the case. The most successful footballing nations around the world are the ones that also have an idea of how to grow the game around the world and raise the profile. So we've done a lot of good things in terms of, um, you know, like our domestic league launch uh, this past year and the growth of that, um, which is a, a very, very important initiative in my opinion because we've had a lot of false starts, as you know, with pro soccer in the past. Uh, but then now that we've got, you know, some footing on the CPL side, um, you know, I want to see stability and growth for the next two or three years because what I do want, like many of you, is I definitely want to have uh, a, a woman CPL division. Uh, and it's very, very important to have the core stabilized before we can kind of branch out that way. But I want to talk about the perspective that you guys all have in the room, and that is as club members, or some of you are at the district level, how do we grow? So w this is something that we always bitch about. There's two ways to grow. You grow by market or you grow by what you're offering, what, what I call the product. Okay, so our existing market, Richmond Hill Soccer Club, kids that live in the Richmond Hill area, right? This is a very, very simple-minded type of growth mentality. Membership penetration, what does that really mean? Does it mean that we go after more of the same? Do we go something after different? We've had this mentality in Canada that we are a very geographically community-based enterprise, especially at the grassroots level. Uh, that's not necessarily the case in other countries, believe it or not. So this is something that's a more of a Canadian and an Ontario initiative or a phenomenon. And on the, on the, on the revenue side, um, you know, we charge players to pay. This is a pay-to-play environment in this country. Again, uh, not very common in other parts of the world. Uh, but I can also say when people bitch about how pay-to-play is the problem, it's not necessarily the problem. And I'll tell you why. Because we have a GDP per capita PPP in this country that can afford disposable income to actually play, where that's not the case necessarily in other countries as well. So there's always two sides to that argument, in my opinion. But right now, uh, there's discussions afoot, I know, on our audit committee to try to uh, see if we can bolster that revenue from fees, because we are, in many cases, at the clubs as well, uh, a lot of the fees have been frozen for a very long period of time. I think uh, Canada Soccer's fees, if I'm not mistaken, have been frozen for 10 years, Earl? 10 years, you know? Talk about the teachers bitching about 1% CPI. But, We've got the same problem. Okay, so that's what we're all talking about today. But there's three other ways we can grow our clubs. If we want to go after a new product, but with the existing players in our product, what do we call that? Right? So we have diversification by age. Many of us start maybe as small clubs or small academies, and then we add different age groups. That's something we've always done. You know, go back 20, 30 years ago when I started playing in Scarborough, girls, my sister, played with the boys. Right? And then that migrated to now girls having their own special track. Something that's very, very common in Ontario is we have recreational house league soccer. And then we also have what, you know, what we deem rep soccer, or high performance soccer. Again, that's an Ontario phenomenon. That phenomenon doesn't even exist in other parts of the world. In other parts of the world, when you visit, and I've had the pleasure to visit now, they just have soccer. Kids belong to a club. There, there's no distinction between, let's say, house league and rep, how we call it here. So being able to diversify, I think, is very, very important. But you also got to diversify the game. And this is something we never talk about at an Ontario Soccer Summit. And it's this. Why do our clubs only offer soccer? Again, only happens here. If you go to other parts of the world, it is a sporting club. Olympiakos in Greece is a sporting club. Real Madrid is a sporting club. What does Real Madrid also have? They have a a basketball team, a water polo team, right? So again, a Canadian phenomenon, but we're so stuck in our ways, we don't see it from a different perspective. You know, we don't have necessarily what, what, what I would deem super sporting clubs in Ontario, right? We got very large soccer clubs, but why doesn't it matter that we can now make that next step? 
Our kids are doing it. What do our kids do, most of them? Play outdoor soccer in the winter, and then what happens? No, they play outdoor soccer in the summer. But Sorry. <laughs> <Brent. laughs> outdoor soccer in the summer. In the winter. And then many, many of our kids will either play basketball. hockey or basketball in the, in the winter, right? Why hasn't the soccer club said, hey, I'm going to take an opportunity right now to integrate. The Oakville Soccer Club, one of the largest soccer clubs in North America, can integrate now with the Oakville Rangers, a local hockey club. Why? Because the kid and the parents is doing what right now? Negotiating with two different governance structures. And what happens when you are a multi-sport athlete, like almost everybody's kids in this room, is you bitch at the coach because this coach doesn't want the kid to miss soccer game on Sunday because the basketball coach has training and then the hockey coach is freaking out because you got to go for special ice skating, power skating, training. Like, it's crazy what we're doing. I've lived it for three, with three kids playing every bloody damn sport on the planet, right? Whereas if we had one cohesive integrated structure, you could take care of the kid and say, hey, you are an 04 lady, girl athlete. This is how we're gonna structure our sporting program for you so there are no conflicts. That way we can also manage her health because that's the other problem too. One coach has no, co no clue that the other coach is also killing the kid three or four or five times a week at that age, right? But if we have an overarching structure, we could say, okay, she's a multi-sport athlete. We understand LT, uh, LTPD development principles. We know that she's gonna do indoor soccer in the winter on these days because they don't conflict with her hockey or her basketball or what have you. So that I think is a phenomenon that I see happening in this country. That's where I see us going in the next five years or so. I see clubs who are innovative, who understand what Wayne Gretzky, who grew up just around the corner from here, taught us, which is you don't go where the puck is, you go where the puck is going to be. And in my opinion, that's where the puck is going to be when it comes to sports for, at the grassroots level. It's going to be a one supermarket catch-all, and the first club that can be innovative enough to offer that service to kids and their parents, they're going to love it. Think of the massive added value. Uh, for the kids and their parents by having that integrated perspective. So that's one option. Now let's go to the other side of the quadrant here, which is geographical expansion. Again, if you go to the US or a little bit more entrepreneurial nature down there, we have private academies now who have locations throughout the US and now have also come into Canada as well. Perfect one. Is anybody here from Rush? Nobody here from Rush? No? So that's just one example again. Um, why do you think that phenomenon exists? Why is it that, an, like Rush, for example, coming out of the U.S., who has satellite clubs, really, in every single major city, also now has one, I think, in Oakville slash Mississauga, uh, here in Ontario. Why do you think that model exists? It's very, very simple. We have this theory in uh, business research called transaction cost economics. And without getting too academically technical on you, it's a very, very simple concept. All it means is that economies of scale will garner you, over time, with increased volume, a lower marginal cost. Which in very simple English means, the larger you are, the higher probability that you're going to break even because you can spread the cost over more athletes, right? So in the case of Rush, that's what they did. They wanted to have high infrastructure because they knew that their costs, in terms of paying for professional coaches, would be assuaged with a higher volume. They also infiltrated the Canadian marketplace. So I'm here to tell you another trend. I believe that we will be infiltrated with a lot of US-based clubs who see the Canadian marketplace opportunity and also see a couple things. Number one, high GDP per capita PPP. Let me step back for a second because I... GDP per capita PPP for the non-business people is gross domestic product per individual accounting for purchase power parity, which is just a very fancy smancy way of saying the wealth of a nation. Okay, so Canada has about a $42,000 Canadian GDP per capita, the amount of gross domestic product we generate per individual in Canada is 42,000. Countries around the world look at that and <laughs> salivate, salivate, because they see that there's disposable income opportunities and that's why they'll grow and they come into that marketplace. So this is a huge lesson for us all right now in this room who run clubs and academies because you think Richmond Hills competition is the local private academy, but then you don't realize that's not your competition at all. That it's uh, some organization like Gallagher out of St. Louis that says, ah, let's go look at the most affluent neighborhoods north of the 416. Richmond Hill looks great. 
we're going to set up an operation there, right? And this is exactly how it happens. And then you realize unanticipated consequences that your biggest competition has yet to reveal himself or herself, right? This is the, 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 the concept of business and being paranoid and understanding where the competition comes from. So that's another one that I believe uh, will happen. Because here's the interesting thing about geographical expansion. I believe the threat and the probability is greater for US clubs, and I'm going to now also say non-American clubs, meaning international clubs. How many times do we see posters everywhere? Email blasts, hey, Barcelona's in town for a one day training session, Olympiacos is in town. Sometimes this has nothing to do with the clubs, just some guy who went to Spain and said, can I pay you 500 bucks to set up a poster in Toronto to have a club for one day, right? So it, some of these are fly by night operations, but again, they're here for a reason because they see the opportunity. I'll tell you one, uh, there's a higher probability in my estimation for can, uh, US based and international based organizations to infiltrate our club system than it is for our own clubs to expand beyond our own borders. Because we set up those conflicts and barriers ourselves, eh? We have the district mentality and the provincial soccer mentality. So if Oakville Soccer Club had grandiose schemes of becoming the largest youth club in the world and wanted to expand to Winnipeg next or Vancouver next, technically today they couldn't do it. So we've established, unfortunately, unanticipated consequences by the structures that we've developed. And the last one here is innovation and consolidation. That's putting all those features together for growth. The development of new products and services that we're offering by maybe diversifying and saying, okay, we're now a soccer club, but we're no longer a soccer club. We're a sporting club so that our kid can also play basketball, can also play hockey, whatever, whatever sport turns out to be the most popular sport. That's the cool thing about being a sporting club. You can move and change with the times, right? Uh, while at the same time looking for expansion opportunities as well. So this one is a very, very difficult quadrant. I don't, I don't foresee us being in this space in the next five to 10 years, but I can tell you that is where the largest clubs in the world are. That's the space that they're looking at right now. So a perfect example is uh, last week's development. And for those of you that don't appreciate what happened last week, it, for me, in the 50 years I've been alive in soccer in this country, was probably the biggest one day piece of news our country has ever seen. And that is for a worldwide respected club to pay, and I'm not gonna tell you the amount, but it was X dollars and it was a lot, to come to play here to set up a franchise in Ottawa, it's unbelievable. Do you understand what it means to have Atletico Madrid set up a franchise in Ottawa? Is like, who are we in the grand scheme of things? I can tell you, yes, we're beloved, just like was said on the panel today, but we're not the, the center of the footballing world, okay? We love football, we live it and breathe it, everybody in this room, but to have Atletico Madrid here come was such a validation for so much work that we've been doing over the years. For me, I want to see that as the inciting action for now next year, when I'm sure Klanikin will be in France talking to Lyon or talking to Lille or talking to Nantes and say, hey, your French football club, guess what we have? We have this province called Quebec and we have communities like Montreal or Laval that don't have a CPL franchise. Here's an opportunity. And then we could go to the UK or Scotland or Ireland that have very, very strong connections with the east coast of Canada and Newfoundland, for example, and do the same thing. Talk about an awesome gift that is because for years and years since I was involved, we always thought that the growth had to be internal. That we had to figure out who was going to pay the multi-million dollar expansion fee to set up a CPL franchise. Which Canadian? How many rich Canadians are there out there? And now we realize that was the wrong approach. That in fact, it's the glory of our country that could be this, the asset that we could have international franchises invest in, which I think is a, an amazing thing. Whatever club you're at, district, some of you are in uh, retailers, or some of you are broadcasters I know in this room, diagnose your organization. You gotta do a better job of finding out where you're at. We don't do that. At Canada Soccer, we did that big time. We talked about our performance, we talked about our health, we talked about what's wrong. You, you need to be self-critical in a very, very particular way before you can realize where you want to go in the future, right? So you should identify what quadrant you're in, right? So what is performance? Now, I'm not going to tell you what performance is because performance is different for every co company, right? depending on your mission and vision and values. Performance might be the closest possible way to breaking even if you're a not-for-profit community club. That might be performance. That if you have too much of a big profit, it's bad. Or if you have too much of a big loss, it's bad, right? So if you're a commercial enterprise you're selling equipment, then maybe profit's important. 
maybe uh, number of players is important. Every number of licensed coaches is important. Every metric is going to be different depending on the organization you're at. But that is only the one part of the axis. The other axis is the best for me. Are people happy? Are they engaged? Do they want to be there? That to me is the most important thing, right? Because you have to measure both, but sometimes we focus on one side versus the other. Uh, because this is where we all want to be. But I can tell you, most of us are here, right? We either have financial problems or we have issues that haven't reared their ugly head yet. There's a lot of issues in our organization, especially in, in sports, as you guys know. Hey, we have issues with harassment, okay, with our kids. We have bullying, uh, especially with the kids. We have the conduct of coaches that perhaps is not appropriate. I know uh, many of you are familiar with the University of Guelph a story that's happening right now out of track. I mean, I spent, you know, decades in the track and field world. So it's devastating when you see somebody who, who crossed the line. And this is somebody who's developed and garnered so much respect uh, uh, around the world. Extra worse, it's extra, extra worse for us as Canadians. Because we're Canadian. There's this standard out there that Nick Bontis will not go to a FIFA conference and accept a brown envelope under the door. Because I'm Canadian. Has nothing to do with the fact that I'm Nick. It's just this culture that's embedded with us that we are straight and arrow, that we are ethical, that we have values, that you know, we have governance. So other countries want to use that as a model, but we have to maintain and uphold that standard uh, internationally. So how do we get better? There's four ways that our soccer clubs can get better, which is an amazing dovetailed uh, antecedent presentation to a lot of you now that are going through club licensing. Um, in this country. First thing is learn. It's very, very simple. Learning is completely underestimated at soccer clubs. And I'll tell you why. Because we have turnover. People who are the president of a club or the board member of a club or the coaches of clubs, right? They turn over. And if there's no succession planning or institutionalized knowledge transition, then every single thing that that club or the president or the executive or the coach learned goes what? Out the door, right? When there's no mechanism for embedding and coding that knowledge into the organization, you just become perpetually stupider. One generation after another, right? You make the same mistakes over and over again, do the same stupid things over and over again. So people always have a problem with this idea of learning. This was what my, my PhD dissertation was on because learning is an anthropomorphic phenomenon. People learn, right? Clubs are inanimate objects. Canada soccer is an inanimate object. Soccer X is an inanimate object. But what all of these things have in common are the people that are in them, right? And it's the people that learn, but it's you being able to institutionalize that learning that makes you move forward. If my daughter, Tia Maria, wants to learn how to make spaghetti in the kitchen, and I'm boiling a pot of water to make the noodles, I'm going to teach her how to learn. But I also warn her, don't touch the boiling pot of water. Don't touch it, don't touch it, you're going to burn your finger, don't touch it. She's a precocious little girl, what does she do? Gets a little too close, burns herself. Now, when did she learn? Was it when I told her? No. When did she learn? When she got hot. When she got hot, that's it. Crisis begets learning. Sometimes clubs freak out when there's a crisis. Oh my God, a coach did something, or a player did something, or we're running out of money, or this. You should embrace it. That's awesome. That's the opportunity now for everybody to rally together, right? I'm not Chinese, but I know in, in Mandarin and Cantonese culture, the, 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 the character for a crisis is the flip of the character for innovation. Because right? crisis begets innovation and creativity. So that's a positive thing. The other way to look at it is the cognitive message and the behavioral message, okay? The behavioral message and the cognitive message. The cognitive message is what we tell people to do. Don't go close to the boiling pot of water. Don't touch it. Here's the strap plan. Here's the business plan. Here's our website. Here's our mission, our vision. That's all cognitive, right? The behavioral is the action. Ouch! Burning my finger. Executing. Implementing the strap plan. Screwing up. Making mistakes. Getting into crisis. Right? Everybody knows, you know, we're talking about TFC. Bill was in the audience, right? TFC won the MLS. Awesome for Ontario soccer in general. But the only reason they won was because four years earlier, who were they? What did the media call them? Okay? The worst professionals, Earl knows, the worst professional soccer club on the planet. And that's where they had to come from in order to generate that new momentum of leadership that caused their learning. So I'm okay 
When organizations come to me and say, oh my God, man, we are in so much trouble. We're on our last breath. We're just hanging it together. This place is going to blow up. It's going to die soon. I'm like, perfect. That's because that's where you want to be. When everything is going great, nobody wants to learn nothing. Everything's a okay. I'm good to go. No problem. So learning is this idea of the delta between intention and realization. We're going to say we're going to do this, and then what does the club execute? That delta is the distance, right? And what you want to do is minimize that distance. Evolutionary, for those of you that are biologists in the room or took science or biology in university, you know, we learn about evolutionary theory. Evolutionary theory, very, very simple. For those of you that don't remember in school, uh, Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands and saw a bunch of finches, birds, on an island. On the one side of the island, it was very tropical rainforest. On the other side of the line, it was very dry. The sun was always beaming on it. So you got these finches, these birds, same organism, same bird. And then over time, what happened to the bird? Right? Developed this organizational adaptation so that the beak in the tropical rainforest side of the island became fatter because it was easier to get into the soft bark to get the seeds for the birds to eat. Whereas on the other side of the island where it was sunny and dry, the bark of the trees was very, very hard. So what did the beak do over time? It became longer and sharper to poke in. How does a species that is programmed by DNA modify its adaptational routines? This is against science. This is why Darwin became so famous for this phenomenon. Now take the phenomenon that I just spoke about and talk about your clubs. How do we react? over time. Now I can tell you the one consistent thing. We are slow as hell. We are slow. It takes forever to make a change, right? We want to move fast. Everybody wants to move fast, but you know, you got to take your time. You got to speak to the customers. You got to have a town hall, <laughs> then another town hall. Then you got to go for a little tour. Then you got to talk to the board. Board doesn't know anything. They're clueless. You got to educate the board. You know what I mean? So it, you can't, if, if, if soccer was a totalitarian Hitler state, things would get done. But we're not. Hey, we're a democracy in this country. Hey, we have votes. We have structures that allow us to not have totalitarianism. And that's why that takes forever. So evolutionary means understanding that you've got to adapt. It's a very, very simple concept. The environment changes. How does the club adapt? How does the leadership in the club adapt? is a very, very important thing. I can tell you uh, on the Canada soccer side, that's all we've been doing. It's all literally that we've been doing year in and year out is all the new programs that we've launched were attributable to adaptation because the environment had changed. Okay? CPL was in an adaptive reaction to the fact that our three pro professional domestic clubs were great at developing the youth of our nation, but had very, very little full-time equivalent professional domestic players playing in the starting 11 and we needed new, more, new opportunities, right? Same thing even with club licensing, same thing with our new database project. These are all adaptive reactions to the environment. Number three, so this is adapting to the environment, this is learning, this is best practices. Anytime you use the word institution, it means that you know what it is and what it means to have a best practice in that thing. I'll give you an example. A hospital is an institution. Why? Because every time you say the word hospital, what do you know? You're going to wait in line. It's got doctors, it's got nurses, it's got operating rooms, it's got beds. You know it. It's an, a university is an institution. Why? Because you know it's got profs and classrooms and TAs and students. Marriage is an institution. You got hatred. <laughs> you got tolerance. So you She's understand. She's right there in the back corner laughing at it. That's why. <laughs> so... Institutional theory states that a club, a district, a provincial, or a national federation has best practices. It's an institution. It's incumbent on us to seek out competitive intelligence opportunities to get the best of what's happening. We do not do that in Canada. This is another opportunity of growth in that last pillar for our country. We don't do enough. Now, part of the problem is it's prohibitively expensive, right? I see it with my own eyes when I visit other federations and I learn about programs. You know, uh, one of the things that we want to build is First Nation soccer in this country. So we go to other federations to find out how they're building First Nation soccer. Yes, it's great ideas, but there's this issue too. I don't know if it will work in Canada. This is kind of not invented here syndrome that we also have. But I can tell you even for local clubs, because we beat the crap out of each other on the soccer field, we tend to not seek out competitive intelligence opportunities with the club that's right next to us in the next community over either. 
I know this is a very controversial topic because some of you are like, I will never merge with that club. <laughs> never. It's kind of, I, I think of what's his name with the, take the rifle out of my dead hands. <laughs> Charlton Heston in that movie, right? It's like, so I remember, is Carl Horton in the room? Carl's not here. So Carl and I sat at the Tim Hortons just down the street. Carl was at Mount Hamilton at the time. I was at Hamilton Sparta at the time. We had a rep from Ancaster Soccer, Salt Fleet Soccer, and we were like, listen, I see consolidation becoming a problem. Can we get together? And I remember his first reaction was, what are you crazy, Nick? You're like, I'm even talking to you, having a coffee with you. That's how much the clubs were kind of, you know, sparring with one another. Now, fast forward five years after that initial meeting, and you know, I'm proud to say that Hamilton United was probably the first integrated licensed club of the OPDL, if I'm not mistaken. And now we've had subsequent ones you know, in Ottawa and a few others. But I can tell you that will be the trend moving forward. So what does that mean for you sitting in this room? It means you need to be that person at your club or your academy or your district to be the first one to put your hand up and say, you know what, I'm going to go and invite myself to that other club's AMM or I'm gonna go and invite myself to the next executive meeting of that other club to find out and develop rapport and develop relationships. It starts with this idea of can you sit in the same room over a coffee? That's really how it starts. And if you can get past that hurdle, you're gonna realize that you have way more common things that you can do together than you can't do alone. So that's institutional best practices. And the last one here is alignment of effort. So we've tried to professionalize, especially on the coaching side in the last 10 years. Again, another new phenomenon. Okay, if you recall when many of us played soccer growing up as kids, either dad was the coach, mom was the coach, or you know, the guy who put his hand up last was the coach, right, at the, at the end of the day. So there wasn't this idea of minimal standards for licensing and professional standards. Uh, but with that now also has, comes compensatory implications, which also hurts our budgets, right? But when you have standards, even with that compensatory penalty, that you have to pay the coaches, you establish the standard and that offsets, in my opinion, that compensatory damage. Because the problem with volunteerism, it's all amazing, we're all volunteers here. Many of us have never gotten paid a penny in 40 years that we've been involved with the sport. But the problem is you have no recourse on quality control and performance. I've been a volunteer now for soccer for decades and decades and decades, but if somebody were to come to me, if Lucille were to come to me and say, Nick, you suck, okay? What, what, what can I do? I don't get paid anyway. I'm sure my wife would say, Nick, come home, just quit. So that's the problem. On the one hand, you, people are bitching that we have a pay to play model because we have this compensatory penalty that we have to now pay coaches that are licensed. Yet on the other hand, they're like, yeah, but I can hold Mrs. So-and-so national A license to account. But the volunteer? What are you going to say to Brenda or Nick or anybody else who's volunteered their time for decades and decades? They're just going to turn to you and say, uh, do you know what I'm doing here? I'm doing this for fun. I'm doing this to help you out. So therein lies this alignment challenge. And I know this is a very controversial debate. And some of you might come up to me after and say, Nick, I think you, you, you said the wrong thing. This is just my personal opinion. Okay? I do believe that the compensatory penalty significantly outweighs the alignment cost for us so that if we can professionalize, uh, you know, our coaches at least, uh, because we hold them to a higher account for standards. But that, that also means as clubs, do the performance evaluation. Don't let the coach just because he's getting paid off the hook. Now that he's getting a dollar, even if it's just a dollar, is way more than 90% of the personnel in the club are getting paid. You owe that person a, an entirely different standard of care for performance evaluation. That's where the alignment piece is critical here. Okay, this person will get reward and will get recognition. This person also has now mobility in the enterprise marketplace because if he doesn't like getting paid X amount at Richmond Hill, he's gonna go across the street to Aurora or somewhere else, right? And that becomes a challenge from turnover. But it's the same thing. At the national level of analysis, we have coaches who get paid, we have staff who get paid, who could theoretically leave and go somewhere else and quit whenever they want, right? But that's, that's the marketplace of competition that's important. The biggest mistakes that we make. Number one, delusion. It's funny because, you know, we're, we're all soccer and rah, 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 and, you know, we can listen to a panel with, you know, Victor and some of the big highlights of our, of our country that we're very proud of. But in many ways, as Canadians, we are delusionary when it comes to what we think we, where we stand in the world of soccer. And, and, and what we represent from a competitive perspective, from a governance perspective. Um, 
Now we're trying to change that, and I tell you, people change that. It's the quality of the people at the end of the day that are synonymous with the reputation that we develop around the world as Canada soccer. I can't stress enough, but having Victor as a Canadian in a, in a, in a Latino crazy world of football be the representative of the Latino crazy world of football is unheard of in history, 100 years of history, right? You gotta understand, there's 40 plus countries in CONCACAF, right? And many of them, as he said yesterday, some of them have less citizens than Richmond Hill has registered players, okay? So in that type of world, we aren't necessarily, you know, uh, what would be construed as leadership for football, but because of the quality of individual that he is, that he's gone out now to represent our country in, in FIFA circles, and the rest of us who volunteer, whether it's at Canada Soccer or Ontario Soccer or anywhere else, you represent, you, you are the ambassador, right, to the rest of the world, which allows you then to kind of stop that. Number two, pride. Pride was the biggest problem in Canada soccer for 100 years. 100 years, because prior to my arrival a decade ago, every strategic plan that was filed in a filing cabinet in Ottawa was made by, who, does anybody know? Who knows? Every strat plan prior to 10 years ago. Earl and Jason know, who was it made by? The president. The president went home on a piece of paper, wrote, these are the 15 things we're gonna do in the next three years. And that was the strat plan. It was boom, boom, so let it be written. It was like Moses, literally. <laughs> On tablets, boom, down. So you have a bias of whoever that leader is, right? So in, in that way, it was, it was about pride, right? And, we, and now, one of the reasons why, thanks to Brenda, I got put on the board was because of my background in strategy, where I learned, studying it for 50 years, that that's not how you make a strategy. That the only way you make a strategy is by to co-develop it with the individuals that are the ones who have to execute it, which is what we did, as you guys know. I'm not going to repeat that. That was last year's presentation. Cross-country tours, surveys, town halls, all that kind of stuff. But I also wanted to make it as simple as possible. As simple as possible because our responsibility at Canada Soccer, as the National Federation, is to provide the resources to the rest of you to lessen the cost. And when I say cost, I mean three things, time, people, and money. Lessen the cost. So when you look at our strat plan right now, the three strategic pillars are develop, govern, and grow. I've been focusing just on the grow one today. Guess what? Every single club, district, and provincial soccer organization across the country should have as the three strategic pillars. Grow. Develop, govern, and grow. Because that's all we do. If you look at all the things we do as a club, all the things that we do as a district, it's those three things. Now, I'm not saying that all the items underneath should be the same, but I would really like it. I mean, I know I'm being selfish here, but you gotta understand the reason. I would really like it if we had a united front. That's why it is called a federation. The problem that I have as vice president is we have 12 soccer federations. So it's bad enough that we have a country that's got 7,000 damn miles from one coast to another coast to another coast, which is a big challenge in and of itself. But we're also dealing with 12 different countries who are playing soccer and have different strat plans and different systems and different you know, ways of doing things. In the next five years, that has to change. We have to have a unified front with a centralized approach. We're doing it on the technical side, right? We've got a standard curriculum now for players. We've got a standard curriculum for coaches. We've got to migrate it now to the admin governance side, right? Standard strat plans, standard governance structures is very, very important. And make them coherent enough so that anybody can use them. All those words that I have here, except for the items, we can do at any, you can do it at Richmond Hill Soccer Club. The exact same words, exact same label. So what am I saying? When it comes time to do your next strat plan, it would be a good idea if you kind of held up this piece of paper. And if you're having a problem with your board, just say, I'm gonna call a guy by the name of Nick Bontis who will come in on a phone call and kind of set us in the right direction. Okay, because I think that's important. That's the only way we can do it. Because if we don't, you know what's gonna happen. 5,000 different clubs in Canada are gonna go in 5,000 different directions. And we can't have that as a pathway to 26, okay? Number three, frozen. So I teach a, a fourth year strategy class right now and that's what we're studying right now this week. Frozen senior management preferences. What does frozen senior management preferences means? Anybody know? Has anybody seen it? What's an example of it? it ain't moving. Huh? Ain't moving. Mm -hmm. Paul, you've seen it. What's an example? Um, inertia to change. Your inertia. Purpose. 
Inertia, I love that word. Right? Look, I, I know I'm putting you all on the spot because that's how I roll as a prof, but <laughs> it's everywhere. I'm sure every single one of you could put your hand up and go, yeah, I got an example of that, where it's just, this is how we've been doing it around here. Right? That, that's the number one line. What, what are you talking about? I ain't going to change. It was good enough. I, I was okay. It was okay last time. It's going to be okay again. Right? So this idea of inertia, of understanding that we don't have to unfreeze ourselves, this antithetical to the Gretzky concept that I mentioned earlier. Like I can tell you one thing, man. In the business world, you guys see it. Eh? If you don't change, you're dead. Done. Eh, the most famous business case studies, Blackberry. Bloody our own, our own technological darling, right? Multi-billion dollar cap. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry and Diane had a Blackberry. Everyone. How many Blackberries? How many people got a Blackberry still in the house in here? One, two people? Right? And they're just holding on for dear life, right? Because <laughs> they're so proud. It's Canadian. It's the only Canadian asset I have in my hands, right? So you got to understand, that was just a foolish mistake. It, 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 was, it was sheer sheer lack of paranoia, frozen preference. We are BlackBerry, we have enterprise server software installed in the largest corporations on the planet, including government. No one will ever get rid of BlackBerry. That was this concept of inertia and frozen. And it took 18 months before that got wiped out. 18 months. I could tell you stories about Corel Draw. I could tell you stories about hotel chains. How about Uber and taxi drivers? I'm going to sit here and give you lectures on all the industries that have been blown up because of this thing. Okay? Number four, unattractive. I don't want to do that because it hurts me. Or it doesn't look good. It's not, it's not as, you know, I, I talk to clubs about this idea of branching out and doing a merger with a hockey. With a club. I talked to a specific club and I said, you need to merge with a hockey club. It's unattractive. I, I don't like hockey. I don't, don't know hockey. I, 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 th those people are different than us. You know what I mean? It's this idea that hockey people are different than soccer people. So this, there's these premonitions of what the challenges are, right? It's quite interesting. And I, and, and I never understood the concept. And, and it's just people are afraid, right? They just don't know. It's amazing that one of the things that I've learned in my life is I can't be Canadian and be too polite in the FIFA world. Because when I'm in the FIFA world, those guys are not, now I'm not saying they're not polite, but they don't, they don't have that bottleneck to, to not reach out and touch someone, if you know what I mean, right? Uh, you, you, and you've got to do that. So that's one of those antithetical Canadian values that I've got to change in myself, that I have to kind of reach out and establish our rapport. Paul, you had your hand up. Yeah, would riskiness come under that? Of course, a hundred percent. But I'll, let's, use ri let's use riskiness here. You're a wimp, right? If you're a wimp, you're not gonna do the thing that you think is going to be a revenue loss leader for at least the initial, right? Because, right? yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, information systems is one of the biggest problems that we've had with clubs. We've had, you know, obviously in our province, we continue to have, I mean, I, two strap plans, not the last one, two strap plans ago when I went across the country, developing a national database was in our strap plan. Well, how long does it take to develop a national database, right? 25 years to develop a national database. It's going to take. But that's the truth. I think every single person in this room would, would wholeheartedly agree with me that if we've got one million registered players and three million what we call soccer aficionados in Canada, we don't know who they are. There is not one single entity in this country that knows who is in our sport. That's stupid in the year 2020. Stupid in the year 2020. We can't leverage the market. I, I, I don't have an ID card. Brenda, here's my son's ID card. Here's the club he plays for. Here's a QR code on the back of his ID card so that if he takes it to an app and swipes it, it gives him a technical history of every club he's been through, what his skills are. Maybe he migrates to become a coach so his national A and B license are on there. Oh, by the way, that card, boom. He goes to the mall, he goes to sport check. Gets a 15% discount, right? Goes to Nike, gets a discount. Am I talking about anything that's not in the year 2020? We should be able to do that today. We should. But ask Jason and Earl the hell they go through across the country. Forget about integrating a national database system. Let's just talk about having our current data talk to one another. That's even a challenge of its own, right? So, yes, Paul. It's also risky. You say, hey, you can say story, but we don't know 
It's not. We've got to. And Paul's right because, and you know who it'll be? It'll be the government who still has credence over us at the end of Sport Canada still is the umbrella. And when Sport Canada comes, boom, with a hammer that says, if you don't have an integrated database, you're out. What are we supposed to do at Canada Soccer when Sport Canada comes out and says, you need to have a database integrated within the next year, forget about 26. Guess what'll happen? Crisis. Everybody will learn, everybody will change. So I'm actually not afraid of that, Paul, to be honest, because it's the same thing that Sports Canada is going to do in the next year when it comes to women on boards. Where they're going to say, you don't got 40% women on boards, boom, you're done. Good, crisis. Sometimes crisis is good. Right? Yes, sir. Listen, you guys are not the only sport. It's every federation yeah. that's like that. Every federation. Every. Good. Well, it's good to know. Good to know. Yes, sir. Isn't it as easy as then as Canada Soccer saying, Here's a database, here's a template to upload all the information. <laughs> dude, dude, dude. I wish. If it was, and I'll tell you, and I made a joke earlier, it was actually an inappropriate joke about totalitarianism, okay? But it's true. If we were a totalitarian state, I didn't have to be elected. Jason didn't have to go to his home to his wife. Earl didn't have to get paid. They would just sit there and say, here's the software, download it, it better be up and running by tomorrow. Or you're out. But we're not a totalitarian state. We have this problem in this country called democracy. That's the problem. So we take our time, we elect people, we do our town halls, right? But the only way the hammer comes down is when the governing body that's outside our scope, that's why I mentioned Sports Canada, when they mandate it. Or the government of Canada, when they mandate, for example, with women on boards. Same thing, okay? So trust me, when I wrote the strat plan 10 years ago and I said, yeah, national database, I remember looking at Earl going, Earl, of all the things we're gonna do, this one, we're gonna lick this one first. No problem, it's easy. But here's what I've learned in my travels to countries around the world. We have 7,000 miles from coast to coast to coast. We have languages, we have diversity, and we have 12 really country federations. When I go visit my friends in Spain, they have a Spain national database and then they have a Catalonia database. Because don't forget, the Catalans, they're not Spanish. You know what I mean? They're like the Quebecois version of us. You know what I mean? They, they, they're distinct, right, to be polite. They got their own, so every country has that sort of thing. But the difference is I can get in a car and get from one side of Spain or one side of Catalonia to another in a couple of hours. I can't do that here. So we will fight the fight. And Jason and Earl will die before uh, it ends up happening, but it'll happen. Groupthink is very, very important for you to be a devil's advocate. There's one lesson you can take from my presentation. Don't be an ass. Be polite, but be a devil's advocate. I cut my teeth on soccer boards with the gentleman that left earlier, Dave Edgecombe, because I was a coach at Hamilton Sparta. And what happens when you're at a small club, you get, we got a board, we don't have, we don't have enough people. It's at Valvasori's house around his dining room table. Nick, can you come? I asked my wife, Stacy, I'm going to go. What do you think Stacy's reaction was every time? What the hell are you doing? Where are you going? And what time did I used to come back at night from those board meetings? One in the morning. One in the morning. <coughs> Meeting starts at six at night. Come back at one in the morning. Because when you start talking about soccer, you lose your shit, right? You, you go crazy and you can't stop. And it's like, if it wasn't for I'd still be there. I'd sleep over at Valvasori's house talking about board stuff, right? So groupthink is a big problem. But I think what we have to do is we have to be Canadian about it. One of the things that is really good about us is our respect for other people's opinions and our politeness. And I can tell you, I know we talked about it a little bit last night with Victor, it's true. When I travel around the world and meet my FIFA partners, they think we are the standard when it comes to being polite and socialization and understanding that you can have dif differing views. Let's use that to our advantage, okay? What we can't do at the board level or even with our senior administrators is have group think, you know, all kind of rowing our oars in the same direction. Uh, with my students, I can tell you with my MBAs, when we do cases, I assign the devil's advocate to certain students. So I institutionalize the process. 
Because if we're all talking about a case, and I got 75 students in the class, guess what? We're all going to go in the same direction pretty damn quickly. It's going to become a boring class. But if I tell five of them in secret, you be the asshole today, right? What an awesome learning experience it becomes, right? So maybe that's a role you want to play. And you know what? It's OK. But tell everybody. Tell everybody. You know, Lucille tells everybody, today in New Market, I'm going to be the bitch today. But just understand that I'm just doing this so we don't suffer from groupthink. Every single thing you put your hand up, I'm going to give you cuts for the purposes of development, even though I believe it. As opposed to how some people do it at the board, where you have asses who just bitch for the sake of bitching, who bring nothing to the table, who don't contribute. I have no problem with you saying that's wrong, but you better damn have a solution. Because anybody can put up their hand and say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. I got no time for people like that. Okay? You want to say something's wrong? No problem. Tell me an alternative, man. I'm listening. I'm all ears. Right? And sometimes we don't get that. The worst thing that can happen at your board or at your club is a unanimous decision. Let me repeat. The worst thing that can happen at your board or club is a unanimous decision. If there was a unanimous decision on something, big mistake. Why did you waste your time having it on the agenda if it was a unanimous decision? That's how I always look at things. It should have never been on the agenda. Because if everybody believed it, do the damn thing and move on. It's the controversial crap that's the hard stuff that we should be spending our time on. Uh, I do want to talk about this one and this one. Operationalism is a big one. This was at the root of governance reform, okay? Government's reform was precipitated because senior managers at the club district and provincial level were in the weeds when it came to things that they shouldn't have been in the weeds for. That was a problem that we had for 30, 40, 50 years of soccer in this country. And now we've kind of distanced ourselves where there should be a significant removal from the strategic discussion and optimal allocation of resources versus um, our, you know, our festival on this day will be on this field and we're going to have Gatorade at the fields. That should have never been a discussion at the board level, right? So that I think is pretty clear. We've actually jumped that hurdle, generally speaking, I would say. There's been a lot of people that have been working in the background on this and it was painful, I'll be honest, because especially when it comes to soccer, we all love talking about soccer, like actually soccer competitions, the games, the tournaments, we want to get in the weeds and it's very, very difficult to push off. I can tell you for me too, um, you know, I'm vice president, but I'm an elected position on the board. I am not staff. And how many times I have to catch myself because I'm talking to Earl or Jason about staff stuff. That's their domain. And I got to catch myself because I always want to move from what my role is to this. We all want to do it. It's natural. We want to talk about big picture and then boom, right away. Yes, national database. This is how we're going to implement it, <laughs> right? It's like we, you, you want to move to the next step because you become an idiot board member. We should have a national database. I'm going home now. My, my job's done. I, I haven't helped. I haven't provided vendors. I haven't figured out the RFP process. I don't know about implementation. So as long as you can see it and you can catch yourself, I think it's important. The same thing goes with conflict of interest. Obviously, it's a, it's a big deal when it comes to the new, new reformist ideals. Last one. The not invented syndrome. This is huge, man. Huge, huge, huge. We've got a problem in this country because we don't see it a lot in Ontario, but I can tell you, Quebec is a country. They do things different. They have a different mentality. They have a little thing like this going on with Ontario. And then we call ourselves, sometimes, and we call ourselves the East and the West is also an, an entirely different country in terms of how, what their ideals are for how we should run soccer, right? And then you have the whole north, the whole expanse of what's up there, which I traveled to Yellowknife with my friends last year, which was so awesome because it opened up a whole new world of what they're dealing with, right? They play futsal up there. They don't even have like 11 v 11 grass field. They got their own challenges of what soccer means to them. So the sheer diversity of what we have is a big challenge for us, right? We can't be territorial, man. Like it's just, we don't have the luxury. Para and beach and women's and you know, regular, we have to decide all together in unison how to allocate that budget. We, we, we can't simply do one at the cost of another. Now I'm sounding a little negative and I don't mean to be because you know what, in terms of funding, for example, women, we funded women's soccer in Canada probably at a higher percentage than any other FIFA nation on the planet. 
in terms of what revenues they brought in and what it represented as our budget. Sometimes it wasn't because we were smart enough to do it, but because we were forced to do it. So for an example, our women, for those of you that watched them a couple of weeks ago, beat Costa Rica in the semifinals on the Friday night before we played the U.S. on the Sunday. We lost to the U.S. That's okay. Only in the second half, you're right. Now, people thought the most important game was the Friday night game. And they were right because only the top two make it, right, to the Olympics. But they were right for the wrong reasons. The Costa Rica game was the most important game, not because we finished in the top two, but because now we were an Olympic sport. And people don't understand, if you're not an Olympic sport, you don't get funding from On the Podium or Sport Canada. So there's so many things that happen in the backgrounds that are tangential to the actual territorialism of the technical people. Because the, the technical people are like, this is what we gotta do, we gotta make it, we gotta make it. But they don't understand. Dude, you gotta make it, not because you're gonna play, because we don't get money if you don't make it, right? And I'm sorry, but you cannot disconnect this discussion of how we're gonna allocate those resources. So I could create another 15 slides just talking about the things like this, and that's not my intent. My intent was to make sure that we uh, do some positive stuff here. So I'm gonna show you a video. This is the video that we use to collect the data across the country. Some of you have seen it. Canada soccer. You are Canada soccer. You are Canada soccer. So that was the nexus of our strat plan. Why is this important? I'm coming to you. And I'll tell you why. Because when people bitch, they got no problem bitching to you guys. You guys are the coaches, you're the club leaders, you're the district leaders, they bitch at me, they bitch at the Canada Soccer staff, but you are Canada Soccer. We have to change the direction of where the bitching is coming from, right? And the Twitter sphere is the bane of the existence of that argument. Because you don't have to read that crap because it's some jockey in his bloody underwear in the basement, anonymizing at free will. But he is also Canada Soccer. The fact that he's causing this shit, okay? So it's really reversing it. And the reason why I want to deliver this message is because the strap plan is not my strap plan. It's not our staff's strap plan. It's yours. These pillars and these categories came out of the town halls and the 3,000 people that we surveyed, the 3,000 surveys that many of you remember that you filled out. And that's why when it comes to totalitarianism versus democracy, I'm Greek, man. Democracy is A-OK. -okay. I'm okay with that. You know why? Because when I show you this, I can say, you gave me these words. I didn't give them myself. All I did was put them on a piece of paper together. And that's the power that you also have as club leaders. One more video and then I'm gonna open it up and you guys can throw tomatoes and ask me questions. This is the video that I'm most proud of, which is why I wanna show you, because it makes me cry. This video, when I started at Canada Soccer, even when I started playing decades ago, Never in a million years, I don't think anybody in this room would have ever believed that we could make a video like this. If they say a Canadian girl could never become the greatest of all time, do it anyways. And if they say a refugee can never make it to one of the biggest clubs in the world, do it just to show you can. And if they say our country can never be a football country, do it just to prove them wrong.
When you think of the uh, profile that we have now internationally, it's, it's an amazing thing. Um, I, I was in Russia, in, in Moscow, when the World Cup did that final presentation and, and you know, the endless meetings and you know, really my job is to sell. That, that's what I'm doing, 211 people. But to have Alfonso go on stage and give a speech that was more Canadian than many of us, considering he wasn't even born in this country, you gotta, you gotta understand, people around me were like, I can't believe that you just had a kid talk about how awesome it is to be Canadian. You know, it, it, it's something that we have to really, I think, leverage and build off of. And on that note, I wanna thank you all for your attention. Uh, this was a little quick kind of improvisational all over the map journey on where we are strategically.